So now that we've looked at the overview, let's delve into the nitty gritty. So we're going to be digesting our macromolecules, our nutrients. So our carbohydrates down to simple sugars or monosaccharides. Our lipids, we're going to be breaking triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol. Our proteins, we're going to be breaking down into their component amino acids. Nucleic acids we're not going to do, but they're worth mentioning because they are a macromolecule. And in normal digestion, we do digest these things. These are things like DNA and RNA, and we break them down into their component nucleotides. And all the reactions we're going to study in this lab are going to be cat catabolic. That is, they're going to break things down. So they're going to break these large molecules into their small molecules, their, their raw materials that we would use, so that we can either use them as building blocks to make new molecules, or we can use them as energy. And as we've said, carbohydrates and proteins will be broken down into true monomers. That means the components that are put together are linked together in a chain. Lipids, on the other hand, aren't really true monomers because what we'll be doing is linking fatty acids to a glycerol molecule, not to one another. So in any case, the typical molecules that we use for energy are going to be our simple sugars like glucose and our proteins, sorry, our lipids like our fatty acids. So proteins, hopefully we won't be using for energy, though we can. Typically, the body prefers to use these to build structures like muscle. So you don't want to use your proteins for energy unless you have to. So the preferred ones are carbohydrates and lipids. But in any case, remember that catabolic is breaking down. And then we can either use these for energy or use them in anabolic processes to build things up. And we use enzymes in order to break them down. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but let's talk a little bit about what enzymes are. Well, there are things that will help speed up a reaction. So when we have things that are going to react in a chemical reaction, these are the reactants, and the result of that reaction is a product. And we can either have an anabolic reaction that takes two things and puts them together, two or more things, or we could have a catabolic reaction that breaks them apart. But whatever you start with, those are your reactants, and whatever you end up with, those are your products. Now, when we use an enzyme to make this reaction go faster, then your reactants are your substrates. And the substrates will bind with what we call the active site of the enzyme. And that means that the enzyme has a special shape. So there's a good slide for that here. So let's just pretend that this is sucrose. And sucrose is made up of glucose and fructose bound together. Now let's say we want to break sucrose down, which is what you're going to have to do if you eat table sugar because that's sucrose. So notice the enzyme here has a special shape and it fits very nicely with these, the sugar molecule, this disaccharide. And so when this disaccharide finds its way into the special pocket of this enzyme, then the enzyme is going to exert a force on the bond that makes it much more likely to break. And that is basically reducing the activation energy that we talked about earlier. So that if we had these things, two things just floating around in solution, in aqueous solution, bumping around into other things, the likelihood that they're going to break apart on their own is very, very small. But once we get an enzyme in there, then the enzyme will be able, once this thing fits into the active side of the enzyme, the enzyme will be able to reduce that activation energy in such a way that the bond will break fairly easily. And then we will get our stable products here because the products will now be at a lower energy state than our initial reactants. And the only thing that prevented them from becoming stable products is between here and here, we had a bit of a hill that we had to get over. And in nature, you're just not going to find the energy to get over that hill. But once we have our enzyme, the enzyme provides us the impetus, as it were, to get these reactants over the hill so that they can now find their lower energy states. All right, so as we've said, there are both catabolic and anabolic reactions. Catabolic break things apart, and that's what we're looking at here. So in this case, we've done a catabolic reaction that has broken sucrose down into fructose and glucose. All right. So this gets to the shape of enzymes. So enzymes are proteins. And as we know, proteins have their complex tertiary and quaternary structures. 
And the shape is everything because the shape is what allows the enzyme to have an active site that fits with the particular thing that it's, that it's catalyzing. And as we know, enzymes are specific. So they have what's called specificity. So that enzymes that work on sugars and starches aren't going to work for proteins. And enzymes, proteases, aren't going to work for fats. And this is because the shape of the molecules that they are working on are different. And so the active site allows the enzyme to be specific to the type of molecules that it's going to be working on. So if you denature that enzyme or have the protein unfold and it loses its shape, then it's going to lose its function. And there are some things that will affect enzymes, two of which we're going to be concerned with in our in this lab particularly, is temperature and pH. And we're going to be working around body temperature, which is 37 degrees centigrade. And depending on which reaction we're running, we're going to be changing the pH that's going to be most consistent with the environment that that enzyme finds itself in. So for example, in stomach, we know that the stomach has a very low pH of 2, even to 1.5. And pepsin is active at low pHs, whereas other enzymes tend to be active more at normal body temperature ranges. Now there are some other things like salt concentrations and other chemicals that can affect enzymes, but for this lab we're really going to focus on temperature and pH. All right, so why 37 degrees? Well, for one of which our enzymes, most of them are going to function optimally at body temperature because if we go too much above body temperature, then we'll start to denature the enzymes. So this is why if you get a fever of 103 or 104, this is where it starts to become really dangerous because the proteins in your body will start to denature. And not just enzymes, but other structural proteins as well. And once you lose function, well, then the organ systems start to shut down. But enzymes are going to function optimally around this body temperature. And if we go higher, too much higher than body temperature, then we'll start to denature enzymes. And if we go too much lower than body temperature, then we're actually lowering the chance that the enzyme will encounter its substrates. So remember, in aqueous solution, you have things bouncing around, just moving around randomly in this Brownian motion kind of thing, and running into each other like this. So the if you increase temperature enough, then you're likely to have these substrates come together with an enzyme so that they can now bind. Or in the case of the catabolic reactions, the enzymes will come together with the substrates and break them apart. So basically you're increasing the rate, the number of encounters between the substrate and the enzyme, and that's going to increase the rate at which things are catalyzed. So as we said, catabolic reactions are breaking things down. Anabolic reactions are breaking things up and you or building things up. You probably remember when we talked about dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. Well, of course, at the center of all this, we have water. So you probably remember from previous discussions that we have our functional groups. And you'll notice most of our functional groups have things like OHs or hydrogens attached, and we can always get water out of these things. So if we think of a, the functional groups, that's where the molecules link together. And we studied several. We studied carboxyl groups, hydroxyl groups. We studied amino groups. And we also studied, um, what was the other one? Amino, carboxyl, hydroxyl, and phosphate groups. So that's what we studied in, in class, the, the very second chapter that we did. So as we've noticed here, we've got hydroxyl groups. And so what's going to happen is between these two sugars, to put them together, we're going to have a hydrogen from one of them come off with the OH from the other one come off. And then we're going to form this little ester bond, this little oxygen linkage here. And we're going to get, we're going to get water as a byproduct. And this is called dehydration synthesis because we put these two molecules together and we get water as a byproduct. Now, if we want to get these two molecules back, then we can add water back to our product in our anabolic reaction. We can add water back and now we can turn it into a catabolic reaction. And this is what happens in digestion. And just to be perfectly clear, while these reactions can run in either direction, 
you're going to have a different enzyme for each one of them. So you're going to have an anabolic enzyme that would put these two together and a catabolic enzyme that would break these two apart. All right, so as we've said, saccharides, monosaccharides, are going to be the primary source of energy for the body. So we've talked about the monosaccharides being single sugars, or in this case, the monomer of carbohydrates. And if we put them together, we have a disaccharide. And if we put more of them together, then we have a polysaccharide. So glycogen is made up of exactly this kind of thing. So we've got glycogen is made up of glucose, monomers of glucose. Starch is also made up of monomers of glucose. However, they are linked in a slightly different manner. So plant starch is going to be quite a bit different from animal starch, glycogen, which is sometimes called animal starch. But basically, they're both glucose, and they're just linked together in these chains, and then you can come along with an enzyme and break off the individual glucose monomers to be used for energy. Now, amylase is the enzyme that does this. And as we remember, digestion of carbohydrates begins in the mouth with salivary amylase and will begin again in the duodenum when we release pancreatic amylase in there. So the amylase is basically going to break the starch down into its, uh, its monosaccharide glucose monomers. All right. When we look at fats, it's a slightly different thing. So we're going to look here at our triglycerides. And our triglycerides are going to be made up of the glycerol, which I drew on the board for you a little bit earlier, and the fatty acids. And the fatty acids are basically hydrocarbon tails with a carboxyl head. And the carboxyl group is going to link with the OH we have three OH groups on this glycerol, which is a little sugar alcohol. And we're going to link them by a dehydration synthesis to get this triglyceride. This is how they're formed. Now, to break them down, we're going to have to pick these fatty acids off the glycerol. By adding water back, we'll reconstitute the carboxyl head on the fatty acid and the OH group on the, on the glycerol molecule. So here is a saturated fatty acid, and as I said before, here you can see the carboxyl group. You can see every single carbon that we have on here is saturated with every single hydrogen we can get on it. But once we add a double bond, then we can no longer saturate it because now we have a double bond between two carbons, and now we can only get one hydrogen on each of these carbons here. Because remember, the carbons are going to be making four covalent bonds, one with the carbon next to it on either side, and then we have room for a hydrogen on each carbon, um, or two hydrogens on each carbon. And when we get to the end, well, then we have basically one covalent bond with the adjacent carbon. But now since we're the caboose here, we've got, since we don't have another carbon, we can make three covalent bonds with hydrogen. But in any case, we have four covalent bonds on every carbon, and two are with other carbons, and two are with hydrogens. But when we double bond a carbon here, and we have a double bond, that means we can only make one covalent bond, hydrogen. So this is unsaturated. And we can have a polyunsaturated fatty acid, and that we would not have, we would have several carbons that are linked by a double bond. And every time we do that, it, it makes a kink in the molecule. And the reason for this is, as you recall, with a single bond between the carbons, the hydrogens can rotate around the carbons and they can spin freely. It's as though the carbons are hubs in a wheel and the hydrogens are spokes and they can just rotate around. And the double bond or the single bond is like an axle. But once we have this double bond, then it becomes rigid and we don't have the ability for that carbon to spin and the hydrogen's kind of locked in place and that gives us this double this kink in the molecule this rigidity all right so here we've got our remember we have our lingual lipase so lingual lipase is going to start this process and basically we're going to be breaking these ester bonds that are really here between the what was a carboxyl group originally in a hydroxyl group that underwent dehydration synthesis. Well, now we are going to do hydrolysis. We're going to add the water back. We're going to reconstitute the carboxyl here, and we're going to reconstitute the hydroxyl here. 
All right, now for proteins, remember we have our peptide bonds. And the peptide bonds are basically formed by the amino on one end, the amino group, and the carboxyl group on the other. And again, we're going to have dehydration synthesis because this part of the carboxyl group will add, uh, react with this part of the amino group. So we'll get water as a byproduct, and then we'll have a carbon to nitrogen bond. And that will be our peptide bond. So here we have a bunch of amino acids linked together in a polypeptide with the red here showing the peptide bonds. All right, so the enzyme that does this is pepsin. And as we recall, it's basically a cleaved version of pepsinogen. So pepsin, pepsinogen, I should say, starts off to be a longer protein. And then it's created by these chief cells in the stomach. And remember, if this thing was created as the active enzyme in the chief cells, well, guess what? The chief cells would pretty much digest themselves. So it's released as pepsinogen, which is a pro-enzyme. And so basically, it's a longer polypeptide than the active form. And it's just like pulling the pen on the grenade in that we can activate this thing. Now we're ready for use, right? Here with the cap on it, you can't write with it, but to prevent ourselves from writing all over ourselves, when we pull this thing out, we have the cap on it. When we're ready to write, we pull the cap off. It's very similar to what's going on with these proteins here. So basically, when we pull part of the protein, we break part of the protein off, we're now going to have the active form of the protein. In this case, pepsin will be the active form, and it will then be able to get to work on the proteins. But remember, pepsin is also going to have to be activated by hydrochloric acid. Uh, so pepsinogen will have to be activated by hydrochloric acid because basically pepsin is going to be your enzyme and it's secreted as pepsinogen and pepsin is going to work in that very low pH. So once we get the pepsin in the stomach, then it can start to work on the proteins. And remember, protein digestion does begin in the stomach. And then as the chyme moves into the duodenum, we have other proteases that are created by the pancreas, like trypsin, which is formed from trypsinogen. Again, it has a proenzyme. We're going to continue the digestion later in the small intestine. All right, so that gets us to our experiment. Let's look at what we actually do. So first, we're going to look at our starch solution. So remember, we got some starch that we got from plants. We're going to add our pancreatic lipase, or, or sorry, amylase in this case, it's starch. We're going to add our pancreatic amylase to it. And we're going to see, did the pancreatic amylase digest our starches down into monosaccharides? Well, we've got two solutions that we're going to be using that are called indicators. And the indicators are going to tell us they're going to indicate the presence of something. So the first one that we'll talk about is Lugol's or uh, another potassium iodide containing um, compound called IKI, which is iodine potassium iodide. But in any case, these iodine containing compounds, they look kind of brownish when you put them in. And if they change to this dark bluish purple color, then that shows the presence of starch. So that's going to show these uh, bonds between the sugars. They're going to react, and we're going to have this dark purplish color. Now, if we have monomers or single monosaccharides, this won't work. There won't be anything for it to react with. However, Benedict's solution detects monosaccharides, and that's because the sugars, the, these are reducing sugars that will reduce um, the solution. We're not going to talk about exactly the chemical process that, that goes on there, but basically they're going to change color, as any indicator does. They're going to start off as this blue, transparent blue color, and then if there are monosaccharides, it's going to change color. But the trick with Benedict's is you have to heat it up. So we put it in a water bath for five minutes, and not just the water bath that we incubated these in, 37 degrees, but now we're actually going to have to take the test tubes and put them into a flask of boiling water, or I should say a beaker of boiling water that we're going to stick on a hot plate. So we stick it in there for five minutes and see if they change color. 
And so if we put the starch solution in there and no amylase, then we should get something that looks like this. If we put the starch solution in there with amylase, we should get something that looks like this when we run our Benedict's test. Now, because we're heating this thing up, sometimes it takes a little while for the reaction to proceed. And basically, the colors that it will run through are first green, and then it'll turn orange. And if we have every single monosaccharide broken down, then it'll turn a, a red color. So Benedict's solution is basically going to show us the presence of glucose in this reaction. Now, if we take these same things, let's say we put one of these test tubes, we put just our starch in it and no amylase, and the other one we put starch and amylase, well then of course we would expect the reaction to run with the one with the starch and amylase, and we'd expect to get a positive Benedict's solution. If we put our uh, iodine potassium iodine in there we wouldn't expect to see a change because by this time we've digested all our starch down into the monosaccharides however one of these test tubes we ran as a control so we put the starch in there but we didn't put any salivary amylase so when we add our iodine potassium iodine we'd expect to see a robust color change so we would expect to see a positive Lugol's test or icky test for our starch if we hadn't put the digestive uh, amylase in it. Now if we go over here, obviously we would not expect the Benedict solution to show up positive if we had put the starch in without the amylase. So on one of our test tubes, in which we have the starch without the amylase, by the end of the reaction we'd expect to get this color with the Lugol solution. When we look at the test tube with the starch and the amylase, and we run the Benedict's test, we would expect to get this color. All right, so here we have the way we start it. This is the, the icky test, so to speak. We have the starch and the starch plus amylase. And we would put the Lugol solution in, and we would find that starch plus amylase is not going to be positive. Why? Because there's no starch anymore. We broke it all down. But the one that's just starch, the one that had no amylase in it, is still starch. And so blue galls will react very robustly with that. Now, the Benedict's test. Again, we had test tubes three and four. So now we have our starch here without any amylase. So we have starch plus amylase. We do our Benedict's test and we add heat. Heat is a very important component of this. Then we're going to have the starch alone is not going to react because Benedict's detects monosaccharides. So when we look at the starch plus amylase, we would have expected the amylase to have broken the starches down into their monosaccharides, and Benedict's will react very nicely with that to form this color change. Now, let's look at lipids. So we're going to have our lipid, and remember that lipids, the triglycerides, are slightly basic. And the, we're going to add to our cream, we're going to add a litmus indicator. So basically, our reagents for this experiment and the indicator are built in. They're put together from the start. So we've added a litmus cream, litmus indicator to the cream. And so when we start off, the cream, which is, is triglycerides, is going to be this kind of bluish lavender color that indicates the presence of a base. Because as we've said, our triglycerides are slightly alkaline. Now once we put our pancreatic lipase in here and we start to digest that, then we're going to be breaking off the fatty acids from the glycerol molecule and as you remember the fatty acids have at their head a carboxyl group, carboxyl group, and as we know a hydrogen can break off from the carboxyl group to form a carboxylic acid. And now we're going to lower the pH and we're going to get an acid as a byproduct. So when we test for the digestion of lipids, we would expect if our lipase works that we would get this pink color indicating an acid. Now let's move over to the Burette's test. So this is going to be looking at the presence of peptides and proteins. So when we do our 
peptide or our protein digestion, we're going to be using, we're going to start with pepsinogen. And we're going to have some, a tube with the protein, the albumin, which is our protein source, and the pepsinogen without the hydrochloric acid. And then we're going to have a tube that has the protein with the hydrochloric acid and the pepsinogen. And when we add the Buret's reagent, we would expect that the proteins that are not digested will show up this sort of dark purple color. And the proteins that are digested and are down to their much smaller polypeptides, so maybe dimers and trimers, we're going to get a lavender color. So let's look at the litmus cream first. So here's our litmus cream by itself. Here's our litmus cream plus lipase. And of course, this is the one that we would expect to turn acidic. So this is the one we'd expect to turn pink. This one should remain purple. All right, so here it is. Here's our base, here's our acid. Here is our intact cream that we added no lipase to, so nothing happened to it. Here is the litmus cream, or the cream that we added the lipase to, and so it broke the fatty acids off of the glycerol molecules, thus exposing the carboxyl groups, and now we have a bunch of carboxylic acids running around in there. All right, now let's look at the Burette test. So here's our protein. Here's our protein plus hydrochloric acid without any pepsinogen. Here's our protein plus pepsinogen alone. So that means if we don't put the hydrochloric acid in, we're not going to react it. So both of these two are controls. And here's our protein plus our pepsinogen plus our hydrochloric acid. So what we would expect is we're not going to see any digestion into our amino acids if we don't add an enzyme. Here, we've added hydrochloric acid, but we still haven't added an enzyme. Here, we have added the proenzyme, but we haven't added the ingredient necessary to activate that enzyme, which is a low pH. Here, we have added not only the protein, but the proenzyme and the thing necessary to activate the proenzyme into the enzyme pepsin. So here, we would actually expect to have seen a reaction. And Burette's test should be positive for a change from protein to really small polypeptides, whereas these should not. So our Burette's test should turn kind of a purple and purple blue in the presence of protein here, but should be more mauve or lavender here. So here we add our Burette's, and here we can see some lavender color here for number 10. Here we see 8987, so basically a purplish blue color for all cases. So basically, 7's protein alone just proteins. Nine and eight, protein plus things that aren't really going to do anything to the protein, and it's still that purpley color. So most of these things are pretty much the same color. In the case of hydrochloric acid, we might be exposing the uh, peptide bonds a little bit simply because we have denatured it, so it might be a slightly different color than if the albumins are still folded up on one another, but we're still getting a positive test for proteins, large protein molecules, whereas here the Burette's test is positive for smaller polypeptides. So we see a change. We see that we don't have as many peptide bonds. And basically Burette's is going to react more strongly in the presence of more protein bonds as we get less and less and less peptide, I should say peptide bonds. When we get fewer and fewer peptide bonds because our polypeptides are getting shorter, then this color will drift from the purple to more of this lavender mauve color. So 10 here indicates that we have digested our proteins down into our smaller polypeptides.